So I just want us to reflect for the first few minutes of this talk exactly how it is that we can presume to explain celestial phenomena. How is it that from the vantage point of this rocky planet, we can hope to elucidate the physics principles which describe and explain the fireworks that we can observe in the night sky? I'd suggest that a very important first step is to understand the perspective from which we are viewing the night sky. And so I want you to take a look at this uh, movie here. The perspective that you should have is that we are at a fixed point on the Earth. Actually, the way that this movie is generated is from a fixed point vertically above Paris. And when we, are from, when we are observing from that fixed point, we see the night sky to rotate over our heads. Of course, in reality, that isn't quite what's happening. If I, if I, that's, by the way, just that extra density of stars, that stripe down there, that's the plane of our galaxy, the Milky Way, just rotating through. It is quite hypnotic to be watching this, and of course it's speeded up specially for the purposes of showing a movie in this talk. But now let's think about a step a little bit closer to reality. So I'm now going to show the same view of space, but what we're going to have is the fixed frame now, the fixed frame of reference, or the perspective from which we're viewing what's going on, is that of the distant quasar background, so distant objects that are fixed in the sky, at least over uh, the kind of human life scales that we're talking about. And then the reality that the Earth is spinning and indeed there is still um, a gradual movement of other celestial objects that can be discerned. So that's a very moon cent or very Earth-centric uh, view of how we can uh, look at the night sky, but stepping a little bit further afield and now thinking about a frame of reference that's anchored in the planet of Saturn. Um, let's see if we can, there we go. So you can see that when we fix our frame of reference with respect to not planet Earth, but planet Saturn, we see the moons calmly, steadily, rhythmically in orbit around their planet. There's actually subtle movements with respect to the sun that are still going on and with respect to the other planets that are taking place. Now you may want to hold on to your seats for this next movie. This is when we're going to fix the frame of reference with respect to a moon that's orbiting around Saturn called Enceladus. It's about the third ring in there and this gives you a very strong sense of how if you choose your frame of reference incorrectly, things start going in di different directions, which are at first quite hard to understand. Enceladus is rocking around, and we've got planets going in different directions according to whether they're closer into Saturn or further outside. Understanding how we look makes a difference to our understanding of what we see. And viewed in this term, it can make us feel perhaps a little queasy as well. So apologies for anyone uh, for whom that's a little bit uncomfortable. Let me move on swiftly. So back to the bus business of how do we explain celestial fireworks and spectacular phenomena? How can we go about that in a way that's scholarly and honest and indeed correct, which is what we're aiming for. It's a very big ask indeed that from the vantage of this rocky planet, we can indeed attempt, hope, aspire to explain how the universe works. But we're not daunted by that, are we? <coughs> it is poignant and timely, I think, to reflect on what's going on on our, own, on our own planet at present. There are worrying things happening. There are viruses that are spreading. The climate on our own challenge, on, on our own planet, 
is a challenge to explain and to mitigate the consequences of. Lord Stern, Nick Stern, a few years ago, said that responding to climate change, both technologically and economically, was a complex intertemporal, international, collective, active, collective action problem under uncertainty. I think he nailed it there. <laughs> I think all of those words and phrases are far from being redundant, but highly relevant. So we should always keep in mind that we have to worry about the business of our planet at the same time as looking out and indeed learning from the wider universe. I'd like to remind you of something rather poetic that I read in my second lecture, the one that was entitled Frozen in Time. And this poetry came from the famous uh, cosmologist, the Reverend Georges Lemaitre, <laughs> Belgian cosmologist in the uh, early 1930s. And he expressed the scientific challenge that lays ahead for us as follows. The evolution of the world, the evolution of the universe, that is, can be displayed, can be compared to a display of fireworks that has just ended. Some few red wisps, ashes and smoke. Standing on a well-chilled cinder, that's planet Earth, by the way, we're quite cold now, we see the slow fading of the suns, that's the fading of other stars, and we try to recall the vanished brilliance of the origin of the worlds. That, I think, encapsulates rather poetically the challenge of standing on this rotating rocky planet, trying to interpret what's going on further afield. And the fading of the suns alluded to in this poem is what we're going to get to today. So it is important to be very clear about what we can do and what we can't do when we're studying celestial phenomena. Sadly, we cannot do experiments in any meaningful valid sense on objects in the night sky. It is not possible to ask a star to rerun its formation process, its evolution process, and its death process as a function of temperature or magnetic field or composition of chemical elements that are present. We have no ability to define the experiments that we would love to perform to really deepen and enhance our understanding of what we think is going on. We cannot do experiments but we can observe in many very pertinent ways. But very humbly, I think, we should acknowledge the presumptions that we are making as we observe the night sky. In particular, we should acknowledge that the laws of physics, which we investigate on Earth and which we can perform experiments to elucidate on Earth, we presume that those are the same laws of physics that govern the evolution of objects in the, in the universe and the evolution of the universe themselves. We're also actually presuming that these phenomena are actually explicable and that the laws of physics that are describing them are deducible. And that too is quite a big step. It's one we make all the time, but I think it's important to acknowledge we are making it. We are implicitly assuming that the laws of physics are everywhere the same, including, as they are, on planet Earth. There are some important examples where that goes wrong, but that's on size scales larger than I'm going to be addressing in today's lecture. So how do we know when we're getting the right answer? How do we know when we're correct in our analysis of some spectacular phenomena in the night sky? I'd like to just run through with you the different types of evidence or authority which govern the academic communities, the physics communities view of um, whether or not we're getting it right in terms of our analysis and our investigations. I think the first type of evidence 
or authority won't surprise you at all. It's the evidence presented by careful observation. It's important to acknowledge that this is technically very challenging. For example, if we want to study phenomena outside of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, there's not a whole lot of light that comes from that. In fact, only 1% of the light that we can hope to observe in the night sky, and that's under good conditions, by the way, when we haven't got um, contamination from street lamps and security lamps, only 1% of light in the night sky comes from outside of our galaxy, from extragalactic sources. And so consequently, anything that's technically challenging is often very expensive. So that is a bit of a hindrance, or can be a hindrance, to getting the evidence that we want in order to understand the phenomena that we're investigating. A big part of progress in astronomy is understanding the selection effects, the unconscious biases, the fact that we are looking under lampposts. We're preferentially examining those parts of the universe where they're actually radiating light, and we can study them from the vantage point of this rocky planet. For many people, seeing is believing. But the problem with that is that not seeing can lead to a lack of imagination about what else might be out there and what else might be going on that is, for the present at least, hidden from our eyes. What we actually end up observing, what we actually end up discovering, is often strongly influenced by serendipity. There are a great many examples of important phenomena in the night sky that were serendipitous discoveries. No one set out to find them, but they appeared in people's telescopes and consequently an investigation took place. Serendipity has played a remarkable role in the path that astronomical discovery and understanding has followed. But if all that sounds a bit overwhelming and a bit difficult, I really would like to emphasise that for the most part, the observations that we make are quantitative. We are making measurements that are calibrated and repeatable, repeated by many observers all over the world to be sure that what we have measured is correct. It really matters that we are doing the right thing and we're not confused or mistaken in what we measure. And so replication of scientific observation is a big part of the scientific endeavour and the scientific journey. So that's one type of evidence that's very important. There's another type of evidence, and that's the evidence from theory. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, how come theory isn't the final authority? How come it doesn't define the yes or the no to whether we're correct? Well, I would remind you that while on a good day, certainly when one is concentrating, mathematical rigour can't be wrong. Obviously, it's possible to make algebraic slips, but I did say on a good day. And you'd be absolutely right. Mathematical rigour can be checked and verified. But here's the problem. Where theory is concerned and where the laws of physics are applied, we have to be very careful about hidden assumptions, about over-interpretation of artefacts that are not the phenomenon themselves, but a consequence of the way we've set up the problem or set up the observation. It is very important to hang on to the fact that a theory is only as good as its axioms. And it may have very limited applicability within quite a narrow regime of parameter space. For example, Newton's laws are pretty good. I touched on those in my lecture in January on shapes of freefall, where we were discussing orbits around gravitational mass. Newton's laws are terrific, but they don't apply very close to very massive objects. 
because Newton's laws don't allow for the curvature of space-time. Brilliant theory, but limited range of applicability, and we need to understand that. An important way of elucidating theory is to code up numerical simulations. Computers and number crunching a particular set of equations and running them forward in time subject to the boundary conditions we assume and the parameter space that we choose to operate in can be a wonderfully informative way of transcending the limits of observations on the one hand and actually also transcending the limits of human imagination on the other hand. We'll see an example of how simulations can assist our understanding a little later in the talk. Now, there's actually a third type of evidence that plays an important role in the scientific endeavour. It's possible that this one may surprise you, but it's the role played by intuition or imagination. Now, let me be very clear that this is something that plays a role in the process of doing the scientific analysis. As we're considering what's happening, as the research is undergoing, as the investigation is live, that's when intuition and imagination play a vital role. Albert Einstein himself would often refer to the fact that he would dream that he was riding piggyback on a light ray. Physically, such a dream doesn't make any sense at all. You can't possibly ride piggyback on a light ray. But that leap of imagination, stepping into the physics that he was trying to understand, that led to the theory of relativity. So imagination and intuition play a role. You will hear us, as we discuss with our colleagues, say things like, I don't buy this explanation. This, this just doesn't feel right. There's something we're missing. There's something that feels wrong. Those are the kind of conversations that we have in the business of doing research in science. But let me be very clear that imagination is not authoritative in terms of the final answers or conclusions that we reach. I can't overstate this point too highly, and I also can't state it as well as our hero, Albert Einstein. In my office in Oxford, on the wall, I have this quote in German from Einstein. Now, I won't attempt to read it to you in German today, but I will tell you what the approximate translation is which is as follows. The business of invention or discovery, i.e. scientific research, is not by logical reasoning. Isn't that a startling thing to say? But he goes on to say, the end result, your final conclusions, they are robustly bound to the rules of logic. So while you may make very human leaps of imagination, and while some of those may be wrong and you reject those and some of those may be right and you follow that a little further, what you ultimately end up with, what you publish in the international journals, that absolutely is bound by logical deduction that is very defensible. defensible. It's also worth pointing out, though, that defensible though it may be on the grounds of the logical steps, in the scientific community we are very clear that we regard our understanding as forever provisional because we know that new observations could change our understanding. The history of science is full of such examples. But back to this galaxy for today, against that backdrop of how it is that we make progress in understanding on the basis of individual simple physical laws, how to explain the spectacular phenomena that are going on in the night sky, I'd like to just mention two particular units that are very convenient to use. And these two units are as follows.
If we start using the unit of mass as being the kilogram, which is terrific when you're making a loaf of bread, but inconvenient when you're talking about the evolution of a massive star, then you end up having quite an in inconvenient vehicle of lots of numbers describing just how many kilograms you've got. So to cut all that out, we use a unit which we call the solar mass, the mass of our sun. And that's about two times 10 to the power of 32 kilograms. What 10 to the power of 32 means is a one and 32 zeros. It's a huge number. So it's much more convenient to talk about one solar mass. Instead of thinking of the kilometre, which is a perfectly reasonable unit of distance, if we want to talk about the distance between here in the Museum of London and St Paul's Cathedral, a stone's throw away, kilometre's great for that. But when we're talking about the size of a star, it can be quite convenient to think about the radius of our sun, expressed as the solar radius. So let me just take you now to the sizes of the objects in just our solar system to start with. So this is an image from NASA of our sun in quite an active phase with different images of the different planets overlaid to scale. So you can actually see that the radius of the sun is over 100 times the radius of Earth. You could probably fit hundreds of Earths inside our sun. Not a good idea, it would be too hot, but it's a very large volume. Jupiter, our largest planet, well, actually, the sun is only about 10 times the diameter of... The sun's diameter is only about 10 times the diameter of Jupiter. And that's our largest planet. So these give us a bit of a perspective on the kind of size scales that we're working within. Let me remind you again of our place in space. What circles the sun, the planets I've just shown you, and the asteroids and the Kuiper belt um, that I spoke about in my last lecture, that total mass has only about one thousandth of a solar mass itself. Ever so much of the structure of our solar system is determined by gravity. Gravity calls the shots. It's always, always, always attractive. We make the presumption that gravity is the same on planet Earth as it is on the solar system, as it is a bit further afield. That assumption actually breaks down when you get to size scales larger than a galaxy. But we're pretty much staying within our own galaxy for today's lecture. The tests that have been done a bit further afield outside of planet Earth on whether gravity is or is not the same I touched on, again, in my previous lecture, the fact that um, David Scott, the astronaut, as part of the Apollo mission in the early 1970s, dropped a hammer and a feather, and in the absence of air resistance, because there's no atmosphere on the moon, found that they landed, crash on the moon's surface at the same time. Gravity still has the same attractive force, the same behaviour on the moon, throughout the solar system as it does here on Earth. After, of course, accounting for other forces that are at play, like air resistance. So what does gravity do for us? Gravity, as I indicated in my second lecture, attracts matter to itself. That gives you a bit bigger mass, and that attracts yet more matter to itself. The early ripples in the cosmic microwave background radiation those are the seeds of structure formation and where you have overdensities, you have collapse under gravity. And assuming you can dissipate the heat sufficiently, that collapse can continue and continue and continue. It's important that the temperature drops as that takes place because it's only when matter is cold enough that it can ac actually coagulate and form the kind of entities that we're going to talk about this morning.
But it isn't only gravity that's at play. Angular momentum, the conservation of angular momentum, we believe to be a conservation law that's obeyed throughout the universe. Angular momentum is the property that a body has because it's spinning, because it's rotating, because it's in orbit about something. You shorten that orbit, it will speed up. You lengthen the orbit, it will slow down. This we believe to be well verified. It's important to realise that when you take simple laws but have them act in combination, which they do because the physical laws operate the whole time, it's the combination of simple laws that give us the drama, that give us the spectacle, that give us the wonderful phenomena we can see in the night sky. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that simulations can transcend the limitations of our observations and the limitations of human imagination. What I'm showing you now is a visualisation of what happens when gravitational attraction is at play, so that means that matter is attracted to the centre of mass, the centre of gravity, at the same time as angular momentum is conserved, so as things spin further out, they have a certain speed, as they spin closer in, they spin faster, that's the conservation of angular momentum, at the same time as heat can be radiated away, so the matter can be cooled. So right in the centre here, we've got a bright star, think of our sun, and we've got a protoplanetary disk forming in orbit around it, within which there are little um, planets which themselves have disks, which ultimately, when they cool, settle out into moons orbiting around those planets, much like the many moons of Jupiter, I think there were 50-odd at the last count, are orbiting around Jupiter, and the moons around Saturn are orbiting around it. It's important to realise that it's the combination of simple laws that give spectacular consequences, like planets, that we can live on. All good. So, if gravity gives us galaxies, because of the over-densities of matter, because of gravity drawing the matter together, if these coagulates give us proto-galaxies, what about the stars? How is it that stars actually shine? Well, it turns out that nature has known how to do fusion since shortly after the beginning of time. Sometime after the Big Bang, when the first stars were formed, that is when fusion was first played out. You'll often hear people say here on planet Earth, fusion is always 30 years away. That's something I would dispute on two grounds. The first being that stars have been able to do this since shortly after the beginning of time. And the second is that being 30 years away implies certain presumptions about how much you've resourced the technology needed to replicate the extreme conditions that we can study and learn from in outer space here on planet Earth in a way that's safe. How much resource fusion is given here on Earth makes a difference to when we will see it realised here on Earth. But back to stars in the night sky, when you have matter that is sufficiently dense and gravity can take over, then that's the moment at which we can begin to get, as, as you condense that matter, the pressures will increase dramatically and thermodynamics means that you will get very high temperatures from those very high pressures. Now here's the thing, when you get to sufficiently high temperatures, and by high temperatures I mean millions of degrees, and it actually doesn't matter too much for the purposes of this discussion which temperature scale I'm using, millions of degrees is jolly hot. When you have attained that sort of temperature regime, fusion can indeed take place. What is fusion? Fusion is when you can get the coalescence 
of subatomic particles fusing together to form bigger subatomic particles. So these can be things like hydrogen. Hydrogen on its own is just one proton and one electron. We can get different types of heavy hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, where the proton is accompanied by other neutrons. When you start to squeeze these uh, nuclei together, these nucleons together, if they've got sufficient energy, because they're at a high enough temperature, then they can actually weld together and give off yet more heat and, indeed, light. So fusion in stars readily transforms hydrogen into helium, into heat, into light. And depending on the mass of the star and depending on the temperature of the star, we can get other elements, other chemical elements still, such as carbon, such as oxygen. And we can go further still into the periodic table. But I want to turn now to what happens. We've got sunshine because we've got a sufficiently dense um, coalescence of, of matter in the form of very energetic, high pressure, high temperature gas that all of those nucleons fuse together, give more heat, give more light. What happens now, later on in life, for stars when they use up all their hydrogen and maybe they use up all their helium and maybe they've used up the other nucleons still? Well, actually, that's a time when fireworks begin. Exactly what happens and exactly how stars evolve depends on a number of things. It depends a lot on their mass. How a very high mass star behaves, say one that's 50 times the mass of our sun, 50 solar masses, is very different from how our own sun is going to evolve. Low mass stars will behave very differently indeed when they've used up all their inner fuel in their cores. By low mass stars, I mean a star that's got a mass between one tenth of the mass of our sun and say eight or 10 times the mass of our sun. That's the astronomer's idea of a low mass star, by the way. Despite how huge our sun is compared with planet Earth or even Jupiter. So if we say our sun is a low mass star, what happens next? What is its end point? Well, there's a process when all the fuel is used up, when a star will blow off its shells of matter, its shells of, of spent fuels. These are the outermost layers. These outer layers get blown off as a shell, following the star having gone through a phase called a red giant. A red giant is when the volume of a star changes dramatically in volume. So if you thought our sun was big now, you ain't seen nothing. In the fullness of time, our sun is going to become so much larger that it doesn't just envelop the Earth, but it envelops a good many of the other planets in the solar system too. That's when it goes through its red giant phase. Now I mentioned at the start of this talk a few worrisome things that are of great concern to us here on planet Earth at present. Of all of the things that are on my list of things to worry about at present, the sun vaporising Earth is not yet on that list. <laughs> about the right time for it to become worrisome is a few billion years from now, possibly five billion years or a bit longer. So we've got plenty of time on that one. So when the sun's gone through its red giant phase and when it's blown off its outer layers as a shell, we're left with something in its inner part that will collapse and collapse and collapse. Fusion is no longer something that can take place. All the nucleons are way too big and too massive for anything like that to take place. And we're then left with a compact object, a type of compact object known as a white dwarf. Other types of compact object are neutron stars and black holes that I've touched on briefly in a previous lecture 
and will be returning to in a future lecture. But what do I mean by a compact object in the particular and specific case of a white dwarf? How compact is compact and how dense is it? Well, in terms of compactness, a white dwarf that's um, had its origins in a star like our own sun will end up with the volume being about the volume of planet Earth. So you've gone from something that's 108 times larger than the Earth itself to something that's the same size. That's quite a lot of mass to compactify into quite a small volume. How dense is it? How dense is white dwarf material? Let me explain it in the following unit. If we wanted to take a heaped tablespoonful of white dwarf material, that would weigh the same as a small family of elephants. I took this photograph on the day that that little baby elephant there had discovered he had a trunk. <laughs> and while all the big grown-up elephants were saying, look, little fellow, we buy water, when we buy water, we drink, he was having none of it. He was playing around with his trunk. He was an adorable little creature, but I could not have lifted him up. Even that little fella is pretty massive. There is no way, of course, that probably even a bunch of us in this room could hope to lift a family of elephants. But that's how much one heaped tablespoon of white dwarf material weighs. So what does that tell us about the nature of the white dwarf? It tells us it's got a very hard surface. It's actually held up by quantum mechanics. It's held up by the fact that you can't squash electrons into the same bit of space. It's quite a remarkable um, example of quantum mechanics, which is the physics of the very small, manifesting itself on macroscopic, i.e. planet size, situations. So we have a very hard surface and we don't have the renewing of heat from within when a star has turned into a white dwarf, there is no fusion going on. Gradually, gradually, a white dwarf will cool. Ultimately, it will form a black dwarf, still the same compactness, but all the heat will have radiated away. But as, as that happens, even as that happens, it will still retain its extremely hard surface and we'll consider in a few moments what happens when something goes thwack against that very hard surface. But back for a moment to those shells of gas that get expelled prior to, as the star is going into, the white dwarf phase. Some of these are remarkably spectacular and readily visible in uh, the night sky from even amateur scale telescopes. This beautiful image is of such a shell of gas which has been blown off from a white dwarf. Now I'd like to make an explanation and indeed an apology for the nomenclature at this point. Shells of gas that look so beautiful like this that have been thrown off a star as they form their white dwarfs within, these are termed planetary nebulae. They are nothing to do with planets. Sorry about that. Um, it's because originally, when William Herschel was looking at one of these planetary nebulae, he saw something that resembled Saturn. And so, obviously, this sort of extended region of glowing gas in different colours was nebula-like. That bit's fine, won't disagree with that. But it's not planetary in the sense that it's actually of a planet or pertaining to a planet. So this one here shows in the outermost regions red and pink colours which arise from hydrogen and nitrogen gas. Closer within to the centre, you see um, the, the green-blue colour. That's actually from oxygen. And this particular planetary nebula, this shell of gas that was expelled by its um, mother star, its progenitor star, as it formed the white dwarf within, it's about 2,000 light years from Earth. Here's another example of a slightly more scrunched up planetary nebula. 
And for many peoples, for many years, people wondered whether it really was a planetary nebula. This is NGC 5189. And it was actually only about five years ago that people detected at the very centre that there really was a white dwarf, thus confirming the interpretation that it was a shell blown off by a star as there was collapse within to a white dwarf. And that discovery was made with a huge telescope, a telescope called the South Africa Large Telescope, or SALT for short. So that discovery was in 2015. There are a good many other beautiful planetary nebulae. This one is called Messier 27. It's also known as the Dumbbell Nebula. It's about 14,000 light years away. Now, because one can do spectroscopy to measure speeds, as I discussed in my third lecture, and because one can just take repeated images and gradually discern how fast that shell is getting bigger, it's possible from that basic information to put it together with simple laws about rate of expansion and density of gas that, it, that it's expanding into to give an estimate of how old it is since that shell of gas was first originally blown off the star. And such estimates are actually about 10,000 years old. Here is probably my favourite planetary nebula. This is NGC 7293, known as the Helix Nebula. This is such a clear view because it is so close to us. It's fairly typical in size, although it's quite a young one, but it's very close by. It's only about 655 light years from Earth. So the stars that give rise to this, they're long gone. What we're left with there is a shell and a white dwarf um, within, at the very centre. Is that the end of spectacular behaviour from such stars? Is their moment of, of grandeur over? Not a bit of it. Remember I said that a white dwarf has a very hard surface? Anything landing on it will go thwack into it and heat up. So let's consider some of those physical laws from a more earthly perspective. I want us now to think about energy and heat and work. These are important quantities in the subject of thermodynamics. And a brewer from Manchester called James Prescott Jewell did quite a lot of work in establishing the equivalence of work and heat, showing they're both forms of energy and how you can convert from one form into another form. He died 130 odd years ago, but all his life, although his day job was running the brewery set up by his dad in Salford, his heart lay in the scientific endeavour. He was an admirable amateur, an amateur here in the true sense of the word, someone who loves what they're studying. He set up his own laboratory. He developed specific tools and techniques for making supremely accurate measurements. I have no idea whether this applied to the beer that was made in his brewery. But as a scientist, he was exemplary in his care and in his dedication. What do I mean by dedication? Well, for example, on his honeymoon in Switzerland, he measured the temperature at the top of the waterfall and at the temperature of the bottom of the waterfall with some very precise thermometric equipment that meant that he could actually discern even a very subtle temperature change. It was very gracious, I'm sure, of his new wife to... Uh, well, I like to think that she enjoyed these scientific endeavours as well. But what Jewell inferred was that the increase in temperature at the bottom of the waterfall compared with the top was due to the fact that the water at the top has a large amount of gravitational potential energy. It's pulled towards the Earth under gravity, and in so doing, it loses potential energy, but it gains kinetic energy. But of course, then the water ultimately lands on the relatively hard surface of whichever Swiss lake it was, and goes thwack. And that thwack 
shock heats the local water. Now, when we're dealing with shock heating, that is something that has dramatic effects on the spectacles that we observe in space. The modern unit of energy, by the way, the Joule, is named in honour of James Prescott Joule. And so the principle that I want us to keep in mind, based on a relatively simply carried out experiment on Earth, is the fact that gravitational pull increases kinetic energy, and then when it goes thwack onto a hard surface, you get shock heating and a dramatic rise in temperature. So I now want to turn to stars that suddenly appear, to spectacular phenomena that we can see arising in our own galaxy in the night sky. I'm still thinking about those white dwarfs, but I'm thinking about a, a normal star that's in orbit around a white dwarf. So let's take an image of the night sky and take a closer look in those red rings that I've indicated on the right-hand side. Zooming in closer to a region of the sky called Carina, and ignoring, by the way, temporarily, uh, the most famous object uh, in Carina, but just zooming in on this pink box, there is a star within those red circles that you can observe if you take an image now. This particular image was taken at the Global Jet Watch Observatory in Chile just a few months back. But if you had taken an image of this part of the sky two years ago, then you would have seen a rather different picture. My colleague Steve Lee kindly supplied me with such an image. And look very closely at the stars you see in those red circles. You can see that the one on the corner, as it were, simply wasn't there a few years ago. Two years ago, later this month, a star dramatically appeared in that location on the corner in those red circles. When I heard about this shortly afterwards, I was on a train from Oxford to London Marylebone at the time, I immediately opened up my laptop and slewed, I think it was the Global Jet Watch Telescope in South Africa, onto that part of the sky to observe it. My husband was expecting a relaxing weekend in London, but instead he found himself standing next to me on the platform at Mar London Marylebone, pressing the shift key upon my request as I held my laptop and slewed the telescope, making use of the free Wi-Fi on the train and not wanting to lose a minute as we captured the behaviour of its early evolution. Novi are awfully good fun to study, but they can be a little bit inconvenient. So let me tell you about what happens when you get a Nova explosion. The story begins with a white dwarf with its hard, compact surface in orbit around a normal star like our sun. The gravitational pull of that compact object, the white dwarf, of matter on the nearby star towards the white dwarf will cause it to go thwack on that hard surface. The matter will get hot. By hot, I mean very hot. I mean millions of degrees. Temperatures at which we know thermonuclear reactions such as fusion can take place. And so when hydrogen from that nearby star lands thwack on that hard surface, that's converted into heavier elements further down the periodic table than hydrogen and helium. A thermon and heat is given off which increases the ability of matter on that surface to be fused together. And it gets hot and it blows out lots of gas, throwing out at the same time lots and lots of photons. And so we can detect it and study it. How much energy are we talking about here? We're talking about 10 to the 37 joules of energy, that unit of energy named after James Prescott Joule. So that's a one and 37 zeros, but that, that's a hard unit to get our head round. Let me try a different calibration. When the world's first atomic bomb was detonated in July of 1945 at the Trinity site in White Sands, New Mexico, so much energy was given off 
that the sand in that desert, the white sand after which it's named, melted into glass, which we call trinitite. I've seen it, it's amazing. It's like green bits of um, chunky glass. How much energy did that have? It had about 10 to the 14 joules. So a nova explosion, the explosion of a new star, nova comes from the Latin meaning new, a nova explosion is about 10 to the 23 times larger than a chillingly large explosion that we could have on Earth. So I mentioned in my, third my second lecture on Frozen in Time that shortly after the Big Bang, as the universe was expanding and therefore cooling, ultimately hydrogen and some of the other light elements, such as helium, such as lithium, such as beryllium, could be formed. But it's very important to note there's more to life than hydrogen. We need other atomic species, other chemical elements, if we're to have our life and our being. The high temperatures and pressures that you get on the surface of a nova, on that surface of a white dwarf rather, giving the nova spectacle, give you a runaway thermonuclear reaction and a chain reaction of nuclear synthesis, which gives us vastly more of a repertoire of chemical elements which are essential for life itself. The periodic table would not be filled in in the way that it was were it not for the spectacular phenomena of nova explosions, which I've indicated and described briefly to you today. There is another type of spectacle that also gives rise to some of these heavier elements, and that's a supernova, which I'll come to very briefly in just a second. How rare are these events? Well, they're stochastic. Each one happens individually, independent of another. We think there are probably about 50 novae that explode per year in the Milky Way. And so that does mean from time to time, there'll be one that's sufficiently close to Earth that we can do very clean and clear and straightforward observations, round the clock observations, in the case of the Global Jet Watch Observatories, and observe those very intensively. A number of the others are further back in the galaxy, the far side of some of the other spiral arms. But the other type of explosive spectacle that I mentioned, a supernova, that's worthy of mention too. They are a much more rare event than a nova. They arise from a much more massive star than just the maximum eight solar mass star that I said could give rise to a white dwarf. What's the rate of those? Well, we estimate it to be something like one per century. But actually, the last supernova in our galaxy took place in October 1604, which was before the gunpowder plot had even happened. The king at the time was James VI of Scotland, James I of England. And that gave what the event that happened in 1604 gave rise to what we now know as Kepler's supernova. It was brighter than Jupiter. It was visible to the naked eye for over a year. It is throwing out material at highly measurable speeds of a few thousand kilometers a second. But consider this, its energy, its kinetic en the kinetic energy of the gas that it throws out in its bright stage is 10 to the 44 joules. So you've got some calibration of that from what I said about the explosion at the Trinity site in 1945. Here's another calibration. In the past four and a half billion years of the life of our sun, it has only radiated about half of that amount of energy that Kepler's supernova radiated in its first few months of existence. So supernovae are also excited, exciting. It's important to realise that they happen not when a star is born, but at the end point of a star, when there is inner collapse, sometimes excitingly, to a black hole. We're always on high alert for when the next galactic supernova is going to be, because they are a spectacle, a phenomenon, 
that we can hope to measure with precision, with repeatability from all telescopes, all, all of our telescopes all over the world to ensure we're getting the right answer, to then test against our models of nova evolution and supernova evolution to reach a view as to whether our explanations of how the simple laws combine to give us the spectacular astrophysics are in fact about right. Thank you very much.